Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's panel. Um, I'm so excited to be joining. Uh, I'll kick off really quickly. My name is Denise Kugor. Um, prior, I was at Valley Bank covering early stage uh, and then at Grasshopper Bank with you know, fund managers and uh, early stage managers. Um, in addition to banking, I also am an avid writer at the intersection of music and technology and covering fan, uh, fan and artist branding. I am so excited to have all of you ladies here today. Uh, I thought we could click off really quickly with intros. Um, it would be great if you guys could please explain who you are and what your startup is, which I will talk with you. All right. Well, hi, everyone. First of all, just thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, our company, Hue, is a biotechnology company uh, using uh, and working with nature and biology to create more sustainable sources of dye, starting in the fashion industry with your genes, um, but, but um, kind of expanding into the entire world of color. Um, and, you know, in the biotechnology space, we are a company that is um, uh, rather uniquely and sometimes in a lonely way, uh, uh, co-founded by two female founders, um, minority women. And, and so um, this it's just such an honor to be part of this panel and kind of share more of our journey from, from that lens. It'd be great if, Medina, you could introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Medina Ali. I am the president and CEO of Safe PC Cloud. We are a Microsoft Silver business partner, and we specialize in data backup, data recovery as a cloud solution provider. A couple of years ago, we started an ed tech division which focuses on reskilling and upskilling uh, women and people of color so they can enter the technology arena. And I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome, excited to have you, Medina. And Christiana, mm -hmm. you Hi, everyone. I'm Christiana Russell, partner and COO at We The Plug. Haven't heard about us. Uh, our acronym of We The Plug is spelt with the A, not an E. So if you're ever searching for us, you're never gonna find us if you use the E, it is A. Uh, but we're a um, global virtual uh, platform that recently transcended from in-person meetups because of COVID to an online platform. But we work with Pan-African and Latinx founders um, and other folks in the investor and business professional sector in order to help uh, create an ecosystem where we can build our companies effectively with those resources that we need, uh, as well as working with founders from uh, early stage ideation all the way to um, seed round funding. And uh, we're excited that we are a Latinx and black owned company and just doing really great work in the ecosystem to help change the narrative for our community for the better. So glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, awesome. Excited, excited to have you all. Uh, before we kick off, I, I know the panel is probably going to get into um, a lot of, you know, deep and uh, somewhat difficult thing, raising capital. Um, would love mm -hmm. to know what's the worst habit that you guys have picked up so far during quarantine on a lighter note? <laughs> That's a uh, fun question. Oh, <laughs> I can worst? kick off. <laughs> yeah, because um, I have one that I feel like is uh, is it, worse habit as in kind of distracting, but not something that uh, but 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 brings me a lot of joy. So I don't know that I'm going to uh, kick it away after quarantine, but it is that we uh, we we got into the trend and uh, adopted a dog during um, <laughs> during COVID um, and our new she's not a puppy, but she's a, our, our new adult dog has just been always cuddling up for snuggle sessions in the middle of the work day. And it's a huge distraction, but but always welcome <laughs> and, a, and a good pick me up. Congratulations on the dog. That's actually really sweet. What's the dog's name? Her dog's name is Daisy. She's nine years old. 
That was a great addition. I would say mine is worse, but it has been challenging. So I know in my uh, early COVID uh, quarantine, um, we wanted to beautify the place. And so I'm a big proponent of uh, plants. Well, mm. it quickly got out of control. And mm -hmm. now I think we are like in competition for uh, the rainforest right now. So the challenge is <laughs> just keeping up with keeping everything watered. I won't even, I wish I could show you, I'm looking at some sad plants right now. They, they need some loving. <laughs> so I, I would say not so much worse, just challenging habits. Nice, yeah. and what about you, Medina? I've been picking up some really bad food habits. All of a sudden, like I'm addicted to gummy bears. Mm. And so a week ago, I just said, I got to get into, I'm doing this online Zoom uh, training program because I've gained a little weight, but I just have these cravings. Whereas normally, you know, I would never have cravings because I think being inside, you're always trying to, I, I just find myself snacking on stuff where I used to never really snack or any of that. So uh, that's been that's been really hard. So I'm trying to get back into this exercise. <laughs> yeah, Christina, I can see. Yes, I mean that that's me. You know, always grabbing snacks and stuff. So that and that's not a good habit. That's that's just. So I'm trying to change that. You know, just trying to be with this support group. We're working out that type of thing because I think after this is all done, I think everybody's going to at least have 10, maybe 15, 20 pounds on. on <laughs> That's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what's happening to me. So, which is not the best, the best thing to happen. So. Well, thank you guys all for, for sharing all definitely relatable things. I think I've, I've done a bit of everything. <laughs> um, so to, to kind of shift gears, uh, you know, today's panel is all about uh, money and raising money. Um, and so really excited to dig into the various experiences that you guys have all had. Um, I think to level set the conversation, it would be helpful to understand your fundraising journeys to date. Um, so the amount of capital you've raised and, and kind of where you are um, as it pertains to, to raising capital currently. Chris, okay. Christiana, would you like to kick off? Sure. So um, for us, for We The Plug, our priority was from the beginning to bootstrap. That was our goal. And um, so we are just now getting in the early stage of fundraising um, and what that would look like. And our strategy has been very um unique in that um, we first wanted to look at partners that um, aligned with our mission and vision, but was in it for the long game um, and not necessarily uh, looking for short money, but long money. Mm -hmm. And for us, we it made more sense to make part of our company a 5013C. So we're a little bit different in how we're raising capital. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking, sorry about the overhead noise, if you all can hear that. But our approach is looking more at partnering uh, with uh, grants. And so I'm a grant writer, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a great skill mm -hmm. to have as a partner. Believe me, Luis is uh, very excited that that is part of my, in my wheelhouse. But so what we've done is strategized um, in such a way where we're partnering with large institutions in order to help bring in large dollars that are going to help sustain at the rudimentary level, our company, um, as well as those founders that we're working with that are in our incubator um, and just in our community as a whole. And then we're mm -hmm. teaching them that approach as they're looking to go the more traditional way of VC mm -hmm. um, and all of that. So yeah, we're a little unique in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Medina, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, you know, I have been in business for a while now. Uh, just so you know, I've um, uh, Safe PC Cloud. We evolved from uh, Safe PC Solutions, which is our twenty-four by seven uh, help desk uh, support. Uh, we've been doing remote help desk for the last six years. And um, when I initially um, started the, the help desk arm, I did. Um, I, I, I borrowed about 50,000 from a friend and then my um, business partner slash private investor, he matched about 50,000. But one of the goals that I have always set for myself, and this is my advice to 
all entrepreneurs, particularly us as women entrepreneurs. And I think a lot of times we come up with these great ideas and everybody is so excited about the next big thing and, and people try to really go out and, and raise this money. Um, make sure whatever you develop, you have a product, you have a good product and you have a good service because when you have customers and you have paying customers, you are really in business. Yeah. And one of the things that I have always focused on um, is cash flow. Mm -hmm. And when I'm when I'm speaking to potential and I and I like to stay in the private investor route, because a lot of times with venture capital, they tend to want to take control and ownership. And today I can say after being in business six to seven years, I'm still the majority owner and I still control the majority of my company. So you have to really consider if you want to go that VC route. I think Christiana makes a very good point about grants. There are there's a lot of grant money out there for women, uh, uh, women of color, uh, small businesses. Always apply, even if you don't think you're going to get the grant. I have someone in my office every time a grant comes through, we apply. And that money adds up. And when I when I uh, decided to start my ed, ed tech division a couple of years ago, people were like, oh, why are you stepping away from the cloud? I said, no, 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 I'm not stepping away from the cloud. I know that a lot of the learning, a lot of this remote and virtual learning, we're going to be doing it in the cloud. Now, guess what? what's happened? COVID-19 and the pandemic has sped it up. So it's 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 been a good year for us in business because we were already positioned to provide remote IT support. We were already positioned to provide remote cloud solutions, but we were also strategically positioned to provide remote virtual learning in the IT space because a lot of people see that as an opportunity for job growth and getting getting back into the job market if you were recently laid off. So I always tell people, focus on delivering the service and the product. Focus on, even if your customer is a pilot customer, perform very well with that customer. See if you can grow that customer. See if you can get referrals from that customer. Because, because now, we, you know, a couple of years ago, we started off with one nonprofit customer in the ad tech space. Today, we have five. And these are pretty nice size nonprofits that are growing in the pandemic because of the things that they do. And what we have been doing is educating our customers that IT is an investment. You want to use IT to help fundraise for your nonprofit. You want the technology working for you when you're asleep at night. You want that newsletter going out. You want that social media going out 24 by 7. Yeah. And you want everything to happen in real time. And that's what technology does. Yeah. No, that's super helpful. And I actually mm -hmm. have a quick follow-up question, Medina. But before I get into that, um, mm -hmm. for founders looking for grants, I just want to uh, plug. So I run a weekly newsletter called Friends mm -hmm. and Family designed to help founders uh, get access to pitch competitions and grants. It's mm -hmm. friendsandfamily.substack.com. And it has a ton of great um, equity-free grants that founders can apply to. Um, uh, given what you said about kind of revenue mm -hmm. and making sure you know that your product is, is strong enough to compete in the market um, mm -hmm. and, and get customers. I, I want to talk about your experience as a Microsoft partner. Um, mm -hmm. What does that look like and how's that um, contributed mm -hmm. to your business? Uh, competitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they're going to make sure you have a, a, a solid product, a solid solution. I think the value of the Microsoft partner network is the, um, the ecosystem of its partners. Um, I'm a part of the International Association of Microsoft Channel Partners. Uh, I serve national in the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, we've recently formed the Black Ch uh, Channel Alliance Partners. Um, there's also a, a tech equity uh, division uh, that's been created as well. Um, but the beauty of the Microsoft Partner Network, and I, I encourage all technology companies to join and if they do have a product or service, uh, get it on the commercial marketplace. If you're in cloud, I think you need to be on 
AWS, which is Amazon. I think you should be on Google Cloud and you should be on Azure. I think you should be on all three platforms or at least be familiar with all three. As a Microsoft partner, of course, they're pushing Azure because that's their solution. So what the value is the network partnering together to uh, deliver your solutions to a client. Uh, one of our partners, uh, Gryphon Consulting, uh, they're leading experts in network uh, engineering and his company helped us with one of our clients, which is a large printing company here for Piedmont Hospital. They've had tremendous growth because they, they, they're working heavily in healthcare. So as a result of that partnership, it helped grow my company. So I think um, it is one of, uh, Microsoft probably doesn't do the best job <laughs> at marketing the uh, partner network, um, but it's been one of the most valuable things that's added to my business. As a, as a part of our products and services, we offer Microsoft 365, we offer Dynamics, we offer Azure, but we're also offering products and solutions around that. And Microsoft provides a lot of training and support around that through the Cloud Enablement Desk. I've also been a part of the Women in Cloud Accelerator Program, which I also encourage women to apply to because it helps you redefine your, um, your product and your solution. But I always go back to my same philosophy. You have to have a customer base. You have to continuously build a customer base. We submit proposals daily. I talk to one prospect a day. I have I have my uh, customer service team. They I make I, on purpose. I make sure they set an appointment a day, and I talk to someone. I even talk to my customers that have been with me for the last six to seven years, and I'm and I'll, and I'm always accessible to my staff and to my customers. Thank you so much, Medina. Um, Michelle, I'd like to I'd like to jump to you um, and talk a little bit about what your fundraising journey uh, has looked like to date and kind of where you are now. Sure. Um, well, I think a big advantage of having a panel is that you do get to have the representation of different, you know, types of models. Mm -hmm. I um, wholeheartedly support being able to bootstrap as much as you can for as long as you can. I think that is just uh, the smartest um, and, and most value preserving kind of model. Um, as a biotechnology company, kind of deep tech play, that was really, and, and, and honestly, you know, first time young founders, that was hard for us to do. And so mm -hmm. our technology was developed by my co-founder at Berkeley. And so we spun out the technology from there. And in order to really get our start, um, we have been funded primarily via the kind of more traditional VC channel. So I'm, I'm happy to share a little bit more about what that yeah. process has been like. Yeah. We started by, um, after kind of Tammy's graduation, we started at mm -hmm. the Indie Bio Biotech Accelerator here based out of San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of gave us this pre-seed funding to mm -hmm. sort of build this initial prototype of our technology and really get our feet wet in the kind of startup community. Um, from there and, and off the milestones we sort of um, achieved at that point, we were then able to raise a seed round of about $3 million um, at the end of last year slash early this year. Um, mm -hmm. We closed it in a couple tranches, which you know tells you something about just you know everybody's fundraising journey is unique, yeah. right? Um, and, and can and, you dig more uh, into that? Like from mm -hmm. the time you knew you started to, you wanted to raise this seed round, what did that process look like for you? And also uh, how did the decision, uh, you know, come in terms of uh, taking on uh, capital in tranches? Because um, I always used to like to joke fundraising is a full-time job. So I'm sure the decision to mm -hmm. pursue more capital didn't come uh, easily. Uh, so would love to kind of uh, understand that journey a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it wasn't straightforward and it wasn't planned. I think like the one thing that I'll share is just like our seed round fundraising journey was really, really hard. Um, and and I think like uh, not enough people talk about just like how hard it is. It always just seems so easy on the other side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, like, you know, going through an accelerator program, 
um, I would say like one of the challenges can be that you are pushed to raise pretty early. And I think that, um, you know, there was a lot of kind of discussion about us um, you know, wanting to kind of fundraise off of demo day, using that as a milestone, kind of running a process. But I think when we were sort of at the end of it, we just weren't quite ready based on when our milestones were accomplished and when we could sort of pull everything together. But what that meant was that then we lost the leverage of having sort of this artificial deadline, right, to like yeah. run investors around. And so what we thought might be sort of a short process ended up being mm -hmm. like actually a long, like six month process of fundraising before we found a lead investor that we were really excited about um, and, you know, could could do the kind of like whole price round for us. Mm -hmm. um, I guess a couple other just like little tips on the sort of seed round strategy, I think, Seed is unique in that you can always start by saying you're going to raise a bunch of safes, right, and a bunch of notes, and you mm -hmm. can sort of um, start by saying I'm going to raise sort of like this kind of more minimal amount of capital, and then as you kind of get more and more commitments, you can sort of build on that to say, hey, now we're 60% closed on this kind of, and you can up it um, and sort of close it off at any time, and that kind of that can lead to a more streamlined process. We ended up starting that way, ending in having a lead who was interested in, um, you know, actually doing a price round. So we ended up going that direction. But then also what happened was, you know, I think the whole process really caught us off guard in terms of some of the like legal and other follow-ups and sort of rounding off all of the other partners because, you know, we, we weren't sure when everything was going to close. And so that was also, it kind of coincided with COVID. And so we ended up having to actually um, talk with our first, uh, or, or our lead investor about um, extending to do the second tranche so that the other investors who had, you know, been interested could actually kind of join and, and, and bring us all the way there to kind of the 3 million. So again, just like not a straightforward process. Sure. Now that I have been through what I've been through, I know so much more about like yeah. how I would have maybe managed that process um, in a different way, but, but you yeah. love and you learn. And that, then- can, and just a quick follow up. Can you talk a little bit about uh, diligencing investors? Um, it seems like, you know, sometimes uh, investors are, you know, passionate and supportive of your idea in the beginning. But as you stick with them through the journey, you don't necessarily always know um, how they might help or react to things going on in the company. Um, it sounds like you got great experience being able to kind of be in the trenches, so to speak, with your investors given COVID and kind of how the, the round played out. But what what were some intangibles or things that you were looking for when uh, diligencing investors before actually, you know, signing that term tree? Uh, I mm. see. So you're talking about us vetting what partner and investor we actually yeah. want to go with. Um, mm. Honestly, like I will share again, my seed round process was not easy. I probably talked to close to a hundred investors. And so like, Honestly, like by that point, I feel like I had gotten a feel for so many different profiles of interests and profiles of people that like it was pretty clear um, who really was with us and who really got it. And so I think like while, of course, we did all the sort of like normal motions of saying, hey, uh, you know, you, you always got to ask the investor for a couple people in their portfolio who they can introduce you to um, in order to get a better sense of kind of what it's like behind the scenes. Um, but I think like you get enough of these conversations under your belt that after, you know, the, the, a couple conversations with them, you, you already get a sense of like who believes in you. And, and, and I think for now, to me, that has been sort of the, the major kind of like game changer and difference maker in, in the investors is just like having people who believe in both your idea and mm -hmm. you as co-founders. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So helpful. Now, Christiana, I'd love to switch gears um, to you and the companies that you help uh, raise capital. I was really excited to see how you guys support Africa. I'm first generation Ghanaian, so that was exciting. Um, but, you know, 
<laughs> given given uh, the state of affairs, um, if you will, that we are in, I think it's been a, a hard year for everyone, right? For VC firms uh, and even founders uh, starting a net new round. Um, in my experience, there were a lot of founders that were able to maybe close their round quickly as things unfurled in, in the beginning of March and April. Um, but for founders that kind of look to start a new round um, in, in the midst of COVID, what what would you recommend in terms of what they need to be thinking about? I mean, the process of raising a round looks a lot, um, a lot differently, um, but also given uh, the volume of companies that you see, would you say that it's become more competitive? Um, yes, not only has it become more competitive, I think that uh, what we do is we go back to the, again, what is the basics that we need to be focused on, um, whether we're in a pandemic or not, and that's strategy. I think oftentimes uh, when things were as lighthearted, if you will, um, you know, we just kind of went uh, with this kind of throw out a wide cast net and just see what you can get. And I think right now it's really important to, um, I think Michelle had spoke um, earlier to it, how do you bet? I think one of the things to look at is your company and look at the, if you're looking to raise, what is it that you, uh, the dollar amount you're trying to raise and can you tear it um, as opposed to just going for the big um, bulk of it? The other thing we talk about is how to adapt you know, you have to be ready to adapt. And um, before putting yourself out there in front of these investors, do some behind the scenes work of uh, what are you willing to compromise on? Where can you cut um, uh, uh, spending um, to get it down lean where you are able to come in at um, a level that is not going to put you in a position where you're going to lose more equity in your company than you're really ready to, or even have, um, uh, you know, a situation where you're connecting with a VC that is not really ready to go with you because you haven't done the homework necessary to match properly. Um, I think also we talked to um, our founders about, um, you know, looking outside of just your, uh, your, your current ecosystem right now, the playing field is really leveled. So you don't have to just focus in uh, your home area. You can look abroad. And so um, mm. what's really nice about partnering um, with uh, other groups that are in our community on Lead the Plug platform, membership platform, is that you are able to kind of test out the market in other countries or other states, cities, and see mm -hmm. what um, the conversations um, are looking like in that um, in that area. I think what's really important outside of those things is also networking, um, which is kind of what I'm talking to right now. How are you expanding your network in order to put yourself in spaces where you can get get a better lens into what what these investors are looking for? Um, and that doesn't take much time. It's just kind of, you know, uh, looking at uh, what network groups. I mean, this one is perfect, right? Um, being a part of these conversations and listening, tuning in, getting links to um, sites that can kind of expand um, your um, your uh, the the site, maybe your blind sites, right? To be able to help better uh, uh, set yourself up for support and. Um, and applying to these companies um, or these VCs. I think the other thing that's really important um, that we talk a lot about is um, where you um, where you kind of are in your business is not where you're going to uh, necessarily be six months from now. So looking at mm -hmm. casting um, what you're forecasting out, you know, where you are now, where do you want to be, and really having, I think. Um, uh, a pitch that can really speak to that and be transparent as much as possible, but mm -hmm. from an affirmative standpoint so that you do have more um, investors leaning in as opposed to pulling away. So that's kind of, 
Yes, uh, that's so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, a few minutes left before we uh, open up and take questions from the audience. There are mm -hmm. some things though I'd like to, to ask all of you before we get into audience questions. Um, kicking off with you, Michelle, uh, we talked about pitch competitions and grants mm -hmm. earlier in, in this panel, um, but, and I know you participated uh, in a pitch competition this year. Um, would love to know a little bit more about what that pitch competition was and what your experience was and how it impacted your business. You're muted, Michelle. Thanks for asking. I actually wanted to circle back on that when I was talking about the fundraising journey because that was sort of the other additional part of our cap table to mention is that besides the seed round, we thought we were kind of all done. But um, you know, as we think about diverse sources of, uh, of funding and opportunities, one of the things we did was apply for um, a pitch competition that was hosted by Microsoft's M12, um, as well as Melinda Gates' Pivotal Fund and Mayfield. Um, it was a competition for female founders, literally called the Female Founders Competition. And that's how we kind of got brought into this Microsoft network. Um, and they are, they have kind of two tracks for SaaS companies as well as for deep tech companies. Um, and uh, th they selected us to kind of be a finalist and then pitch in front of this panel of investors. And we were super honored, um, you know, in earlier this year to be selected for the award in the deep tech kind of US track. And that has been um, such a big blessing for us during this time of COVID. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it, uh, I, I, you know, can't say enough enough good things, and we're just starting to, I think, realize some of the benefits of just being plugged into the Microsoft network through that. Um, but I guess, like, what kind of briefly, um, what I would say, sort of say as a follow up to that, in terms of the just general funding strategy, is just that um, you know we do have the kind of pitch competition and grant. We, we apply for these sorts of like grant opportunities all the time. We are also um, and then besides that in the you know, VC funding, we are also supported by a government grant. I know people were asking what different types of grants. The only one that we have on the um, government side is the SBIR, NSF SBIR grant. And that's a great, um, you know, very broadly applicable kind of science-based um, grant that has been super helpful for us. Um, and, and, and my just like quick kind of spiel on, on just like finding the right opportunities to pitch for. I think it really depends on like the size and stage of your company, but like kind of given where we are at this point and the amount of funds that we have, I always have to balance between how much time is it gonna take to kind of go through the application process um, and you know, uh, you know how much is the reward? Um, and usually there's a lot of like grant opportunities that are just like quick and easy. And so yes, just like Mindina said, like totally apply to all of them because you never know. Um, and then other ones that are a little bit more lengthy, I think we have to now be a little bit more choosy on time with. Um, but I think that the biggest advice is like, you know, with this, female founders competition, we honestly never in a million years dreamed that we would like win this thing. I, I think we, we felt like it was um, such a stretch, but that didn't stop us from applying. And I think like, that's the thing to know is like, no matter how far of a stretch you think it is, um, I think don't let that, the fear of that um, stop you from putting in an application and putting your best foot forward. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, Medina, it, it was great hearing your experiences earlier um, as a partner and kind of how being a part of, um, uh, you know, a part of that community has led to tangible mm -hmm. things for your business. Um, I know that there's a new kind of partner opportunity being launched, um, and I was wondering if you could share more information about it. Uh, are you referring to the Black Channel Partner Alliance? Yes. Okay. Um, well, you know, the, the challenge I think for um, black entrepreneurs in general is uh, we don't have a lot of similar networks. Uh, we don't have similar access to capital. Um, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to get resources. Um, a lot of my colleagues are, you know, first generation, not only entrepreneurs, but also first generation college graduates and the first in their families to go into technology. And then now you're stepping into that whole world of entrepreneurship. And, you know, I remember, um, I, actually I got my master's degree at Cornell University. And I remember when we were interviewing and, uh, you know, and I just remember some of my 
white male colleagues, you know, their fathers just made a few calls to Wall Street and they had a job. They didn't interview. They didn't. Uh, one actually started a company right, right outside of uh, college. I think he got a million dollar investment, you know, from a family friend. So the whole the whole notion to create this alliance is to is, is an opportunity for Microsoft to mentor uh, right now uh, in the accelerator program. There's about 25 uh, black channel partners, Microsoft uh, partners, uh, black owned, both women and men. And the whole um, the whole idea of this accelerator over the next 12 to 18 months is to really mentor, develop and grow profitable businesses. And so one of the things that I know we've been talking a lot about raising the money, you know, having the products and services, having your cash flow, uh, a later stage in business is achieving profitability. And how do you achieve profitability? And that is, you know, people say it's simply just, you know, taking your, you know, your income divided by your expenses and that's your net profit. But it, it's a little bit further where you go into the analysis of your cost of goods sold and really look and say, gosh, is this costing me more to really generate this type of revenue? So the whole purpose of this program is to really strengthen the businesses to build generational wealth. So as you build, you know, as one of the things, one of the things I love about um, the, the whole initiative behind uh, Black uh, Women Talk Tech is to really build billion dollar uh, women enterprises. And that's kind of what the Black Channel Partner Alliance, some of the uh, Microsoft channel partners are billion, multi-billion dollar companies. So it's very important that we begin to think about building generational wealth, not only for our children, but our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, because this also, you know, in systemic racism, it ends a lot of the poverty and a lot of the issues that impact African-Americans. Thank you so, so much, Medina. That's so helpful. So okay. jumping into audience questions, um, our first question is directed at Michelle. Uh, can you speak towards the benefits of raising on a safe versus a convertible note? Yeah, I tried to answer that in the um, in the chat because I know it's a, it's a little bit more of a quick answer. I think my basic guidance, and obviously, like I'm not an investor, but, you know, take it for what you will. But I think safes um, are kind of like the YC uh, response. I think like the next evolution of of a note um, that is tends to be a little bit more founder friendly. And so, as much as you can, I would say like start by proposing the safe, and if you can get a couple investors, sort of on that, then you have sort of that established foundation to say, hey, we're raising a round on safes. Um, and, and, and that can be that can be easier. We, we that being said, we have taken convertible notes as well. So it's just, um, you know, it, it, sometimes you don't necessarily have the choice, but um, but but on on the margin kind of safes are a little bit more founder friendly. Yeah, and that's typically kind of what I see. It's more uh, what the investor is willing to to accommodate. And Christiana, jump in here if you um, have any thoughts to add. But yeah, typically, uh, while all founders would probably love to raise on safes, all investors don't want to sign safes um, and are going to push more towards a convertible note or a price round. Um, so I, I would think also about optionality and also what investors might not want to participate in a round potentially if it's a safe, especially if that's going to matter from a strategic investor perspective. Um, so jumping into the next question, also it's target, targeted towards you, Michelle. Um, what would you have done differently during the fundraise process? Oh, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I feel like there's, there's a lot and yet I also feel like there's just so much that you can't, um, you know, control. Obviously, like everybody says things about kind of like running a super tight process. So I think like as much as you can, you know, run that tight process, which means, you know, research all your investors in advance um, that you think are kind of good fits for you. Um, I thought 
Um, so we participated in the All Raise um, program, which I think per, after the fact actually provided a lot of you know additional helpful tips that I think I would have liked to know along the way. But like things like okay, so you first you got your list um, and you've done all your research, and then you you know basically consolidate when you have all of the warm intros that are going out, and then you kind of want to schedule um, you know ask to schedule like four to you know four weeks out or something like that so you can then have kind of like a dedicated block of time that you're like talking to all of the investors at the same time so that hopefully you're running a bunch of these processes in parallel those are all things that i learned <laughs> but didn't necessarily always get to do and so certainly i think you know coming into like the series a it's something that you know i'll i'll, I'll you know want to test out a little bit more but but i think like i guess like a couple Kind of reflections that people um, shared with me after that I like just wish I knew and could remind myself of along the way is like uh, again like everybody tells you the kind of you'll either hear like you know the the uh, glorious outcome at the end or you hear like what the optimal process is but you don't hear enough about like all of the sort of like hardship and you know whatever ups and downs along the way and the truth is like the perfect process really only happens in like 10 to 20% of cases. And it's really the majority yeah. of the cases that it's a roller coaster of a process yeah. and that's okay. And you have to yeah. like give yourself grace and yeah. kind of accept this through that whole thing. Yeah, no, totally agree. And uh, as someone <laughs> who's been at a bank and gotten to see this process play out uh, many times over, um, I think that everyone, you know, has a plan, has an ideal outcome. And even the founders that end up raising the amount of capital that they want or even become oversubscribed, things don't fully go their way. Um, and so, yeah, I think adaptability and flexibility is also ultimately going to serve founders really, really well during this process. Um, and so something to keep in mind. Um, with that being said, though, Medina, I would want to, I do, do want to touch on something that you mentioned earlier as it rates, relates to cash flow and customers. Uh, for businesses that are basically using, um, you know, cash flow or the, their customers as their main source of capital um, to grow their company, mm -hmm. what are some tips and tricks or even just things to be mindful of? Um, um, that you recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I always recommend to founders is if they're mm -hmm. doing uh, enterprise contracts to try and incentivize uh, getting paid up front over, instead of over yes. time. Um, but just curious, what are some of the other things you would recommend or caution these founders about? Well, again, um, you made a really good point. Um, you know, we try to get you know, paid as quickly as we can. You know, we, we process uh, credit cards. Uh, we've set up where we're able to receive ACH. So you want to make sure you're able to uh, receive your payments um, very quickly. And um, you want to offer your clients discounts for them to pay you quickly and try to, you know, get paid electronically as best as possible. But when you're when you have built that cash flow, um, focus on trying your best to maintain that business credit because Michelle is so right. There's so many ups and downs, and I commend her, and I'm so proud of her that she had the courage and was able to achieve what she was able to achieve. And I think that is just such an inspiration because sometimes you don't think it's going to happen, and it, and then it does happen. And that's why it's important for you to continue to do pitch competitions, grants, uh, continue to raise money. But one of the things that we're doing is we're setting up lines of credit. So as long as the banks can see that you have cash flow and you're building a strong business, they will work with you. Your bank, your 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 best business partner may be your bank, and I'm not saying it could be the traditional bank. Uh, it may be the bank you're you have you know Denisha with that you all have because I've been reading a lot about Grasshopper, but my I always say hey start building that business credit that line of credit. Uh, if you know it's flowing, the mm -hmm. the banks will work with you, and that's why I tell people all the time. They, they spend years just trying to raise capital and raise mm -hmm. capital and they get to this stage, that stage and all of that. But 
today, like right now, we're in the midst of developing three technology products, a mobile app, a mobile app, uh, a chat, uh, an AI uh, bot. Uh, we're in the, we have a uh, cybersecurity client where we're, we're building a, a unique uh, SaaS database. You know, we, we evolved into the IT development uh, place. We weren't originally that, you know, like I said, we started off as a, a help desk, but because of that help and service desk that filled the cash flow into my business. Now, over the past couple of years, we have started developing custom IT solutions. But as we develop those solutions, we work in conjunction with our clients to help them raise the, the capital. But I'm always telling my client, where's the customer? Yeah. You have this idea, you have this product, but who's your customer? Who are we building this product for? Yeah, no, that's super helpful. And uh, mm -hmm. kind of, I, I would like to reemphasize that point about working with banks um, and doing it as early as possible. Don't be afraid of understanding and also talking mm -hmm. to your bank to think about what they would want to see from your business to be able to tap into those additional sources of capital. Um, and just another friendly tip, it's always better to put those facilities in place before you need it or before you need to draw down on it. It'll allow you to have more favorable uh, rates um, and a cheaper cost of capital in the long run. And it will continue to build that rapport and relationship. Uh, so in the events that there is something or you are in a cash crunch or you even need to work out different repayment terms that you have that relationship um, already set. So really, really appreciate that, Medina. Um, so closing things off, um, before we end with our parting words, Christiana, I wanted to, um, to speak to you briefly kind of about what, are the challenges after fundraising or raising capital um, that you've witnessed founders experience or not necessarily be prepared for? Um, I think lately everyone, and as you should, you know, celebrates the capital raise, but in a lot of ways, the work is just beginning to, as Medina said, build a sustainable and profitable business. Um, so what are, what are some things after fundraising or once founders have that capital that they should be conscientious of? Yeah, sure. Some of the things I think that is important and everyone kind of spoke to it is, um, again, having the fundamentals um, at your accessibility before you even go out and start raising. So if you have your budget in place, if you already have, you know, an idea of who you want to hire, you already have your team, those things are really helpful to help avoid unnecessary challenges. But what oftentimes we've seen in our experience with my a business partner and I is that most of those things weren't in place. So they got the funds, they started raising, it was all exciting. And then they start hiring, bringing people on, spending money. And it wasn't, uh, it was poorly allocated and didn't yield the outcomes. Um, and so one of the things that we have helped with Kurt telling that is um, having a process in place, having a three year budget plan in place, making sure the mentors um, are set up properly so that you don't um, encounter some of those um, challenges that can be avoided. I think one of the things that is necessary to understand is that when you're going out looking to raise, again, do your homework in advance to make sure you're partnering with those um, partners that want to actually help support you on this journey. Uh, early um, mentoring and coaching along the way, make sure they're not checking out on you. Uh, make sure there's not a disconnect with expectations. So it's a lot of that kind of early preparation that uh, can help avoid some of the um, mishaps that happen down the road. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I, I want to thank you all for the time today, um, to, you know, sharing your, your journeys um, as well as tips for founders. Uh, for closing, it would be great if you could share how people could support you or get in contact with you, as well as just a final uh, piece of closing advice for, for the entrepreneurs on this call. Um, okay, I'll go first. So I put my link in there for LinkedIn. You can connect with me on there. I also put our website. You can learn more about what we do over at We The Plug. Um, and um, in closing, I just say, you know, strategy is king, um, queen, king. <laughs> uh, make mm -hmm. sure that you have the right advisors around you. Um, diversify your advisors. 
Um, I know um, it's important for us to stay connected to community as women, as women of color, as black women. I think it's also to recognize the uh, advantages of diversifying your mm -hmm. um, your mentees and coaches. So uh, look for people who mm -hmm. may be in um, opposing um, uh, uh, genres as you, but have strong um, uh, strengths in areas that you might be cha uh, challenged in, whether it's finances, whether it's tech, um, you know, and, and just be willing, like I said, to adapt. Because uh, sometimes, mm -hmm. even though you may be the leader of your company, the founder of the company, you don't have all the, um, the wherewithal to push the company forward. So be flexible. Thanks, Roshanna. Michelle, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I, um, so our email it, or our, our website is hue.bio. Um, feel free to follow us there as well as on LinkedIn. I always respond um, to, to LinkedIn messages. Um, so so open, to, open to that and, and always help, happy to help um, support other female entrepreneurs as well as folks, especially in the deep tech space. Um, and then the other thing that you can do to support us is really just start getting um, a little bit more aware of uh, your wardrobe and how you can shop more sustainably. Um, and I think uh, definitely, I, I hope that you all will be on the lookout for when uh, you know clothing and jeans powered with hue dyes are available on the market. Um, in terms of my advice for everyone, um, I, I, I guess I would just say the number one thing that has been the challenge for me over the last you know, two years has really just been believing in yourself. Um, and it applies in so many you know, different contexts because again of the ups and downs of just the company building process, your confidence can often kind of take the biggest hit. Um, but especially in the fundraising process, like to get a little bit more tactical, I would say, remember that it's your company and nobody knows how to run your company or what the metrics are to look for in your company better than you. So tell your own story and don't let kind of other investor direction um, kind of trip you up. Not to say don't be, you know, be humble and everything in moderation, but but own that it's it's your company and, and your story um, and don't let your confidence be shaken. Thanks. And Medina. Um, my, um, well, first of all, I did put my LinkedIn profile so in the uh, chat. So please connect with me on LinkedIn. Our website is www.safeeasycloud.com. I also put in um, our ed tech uh, site as well. Um, you know, my feedback is, again, you know, it's important to have confidence believe in yourself when um you you are rejected because you're gonna often hear a lot more no's than yes uh you have to continue to believe in your business model and what you're doing and um i think christiana hit a really good point about having very good advisors having good people around you having people that are going to stretch you in a way that uh, makes you think outside of the box. Um, I think Michelle, again, having the courage to, you know, kind of step out of her, you know, comfort zone and then actually win the competition. Um, I'm familiar a little bit with M12. I know it's not easy <laughs> um, because of the Microsoft uh, network. Um, but, you know, again, um, you know, and continue to stay involved in organizations like this. Um, you know, I wish 10 years ago we had uh, Black Women Talk Tech. Um, I think it's important to, to, to network and to join organizations that are going to support you and your vision. So good luck to everyone. And Thank I'm available you. if you need me. Thank you so much. Uh, so wrapping up, I just wanna give a quick reminder to join the breakout session with Microsoft later on to learn about the funding and resources available through the Black and African American Partner Growth Initiative, as well as hear from the Microsoft for Startups team about how to get your business on the right foot with Microsoft. Um, if you guys have additional questions about how you can work with Microsoft or how Microsoft can support your business, you can go to aka.f ms slash partner growth to learn more. Um, one more time, I'd like to say thank you to all the panelists as well as Microsoft for helping facilitate this um, and looking forward to the next session.
Thank you, Denisha. You were awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Christiana, Mendina, Michelle, and Denisha for that powerful conversation. And of course, a special thanks to Microsoft, one of our stronger supporters and advocates of Black women in tech, y'all. So we want you to show them some love, throw some hearts in the chat for them. And we want to go ahead and give a little second reminder. We are giving away free one-year subscription to Masterclass, y'all. Masterclass has over 90 video classes from world-renowned leader experts, right? In business, in tech, in leadership, cooking, and much, much more. We are selecting winners throughout the conference. So just go ahead and post your favorite quote, uh, maybe the conference flyer using the hashtag FOF Summit, or um, you can also post it on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and just tag us and we'll go ahead and um, find a winner. But our very first winning girl is Melissa R. Borden. So thank you so much, Melissa, for your amazing, amazing post. So congratulations and make sure you um, um, give her a high five through the chat. <laughs> and so coming up next, y'all, we have um, so much in store for you. I hope you are all enjoying the comp so far. And so all of you have the option now to check out the Face of a Founder Summit breakout sessions. Um, this is where you can actually ask more detailed questions of our panelists and additional partners through all the different chats. You can decide what um, what type of conversation you want to join in. If you look on the left side of your screen, you'll see an icon that says sessions. Click on there and you'll see seven conversations you can join in and dive in. Um, if you want to know where I'll be, you can join me um, and BET's Kimberly Page, Kimberly, Kimberly Blackwell, and Tana Sams in a conversation on entrepreneurs to investors, how to turn no into a yes, and why betting on Black women really matter. So enjoy your conversations, y'all, and I'll see you back here at 6 p.m. Enjoy.